befuddled, ambivalent, but ultimately pretty awesome. Hey everybody, this is DM Mike, and today I'm in a different room. I'm actually in our movie room where we play Dungeons and Dragons. I'm not going to turn the camera around and show things because I'm just mess up the entire video. Uh, but this is typically where I sit. Uh, right here is my Dungeon Master screen. Uh, back here is the movie screen. It's about eight feet long. We don't use it. We don't use the projector. I wanted to at one point, but the uh, projector is kind of old. It only has like 800 lumens, which is pretty dim. And if you want to play with lights on, you really got to have like a projector that's hitting about two or three thousand lumens. So we don't use it, but this is where we typically play. Uh, there's six of us in here. Um, and I've got some black tables here and whatnot. Let me show you just, uh, these are our initiative cards. You know, while I'm here, I mean, I'll just show you, right? Oh, let me show you this. I came across this. This thing is pretty freaking awesome. Let me see, make sure I'm looking at the camera right. This is uh, where we, I have now decided to put all my inspiration, uh, inspiration dice. This is uh, a wine goblet. I wish I had some kind of comparison, but here, you know, uh, some kind of scale I could use, but uh, this is, uh, I found this on Amazon, and uh, I was kind of researching these back in February, I wanted to buy six of these, not this particular style, but six different ones for my characters, everybody would have their own cup that represented their characters, but this is the one I got for a Dungeon Master, let me tell you, this is, it's so dark in here, because this is, this is my movie room, so the lighting is very low, uh, but this is, has tremendous amount of detail on it, and it has, actually has some pretty hefty weight, Again, if you want to pick something like this up, go to Amazon. Um, I was really surprised by it. And uh, again, what I'm going to do with this, this is this is the cup of a dungeon master, let me tell you. Uh, what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to put uh, inspiration dice uh, in there and you know maybe put it at the center of the table eventually. And when people are granted inspiration, which only has really happened only twice so far in about six or seven sessions, uh, they get to take uh, you know a dice out of the cup. But uh, this is, so it's made for wine, and this little thing comes out, and you can kind of plop it back in there. Fits really nicely. Um, but yeah, I was just kind of really surprised by this. It's uh, actually really really cool. Um, but since we're here, let me just show you. Uh, these are our initiative cards. I'm gonna make sure I get this right in the camera. These are the ones I just created for our characters. Now, there's some reflection here. Uh, it's just got some lamination on it, so that's why. Uh, this is Storm, and on the back uh, is a little bit of his environment. This is probably not gonna go well. Um, and you know, we use uh, not dry erase, wet erase markers, and everybody come puts some, you know, puts their um, initiative score on it. Here's one for our cleric. Uh, they're not really this dark, it's just this room is that dark. Um, and on the back of her is like kind of like this old temple. Um, <clears throat> I think I probably, let me get a, maybe there's a brighter one here. Or, or maybe not. Gosh, I'm just really, a, I'm, a, I'm a dark dude. Well, here's Cricket, our fae. Really, I swear these are brighter. <laughs> uh, there we go, a little bit. Uh, she's got her own little initiative card. And on the back here is an old statue of a, a winged creature. Kind of, I guess you would call it angelic and angel. Um, but yeah, I've got all, all these. Here's our Althea, our cleric. I'm sorry, our druid. Man, I always get those confused. Uh, on the back of hers was like a forest environment. Mortimer, our ranger. This one's really kind of dark. And on the back here is just some old ruins, uh, castle ruins. He has a... Uh, uh, well, his backstory is uh, he was part of a squad and whatnot, and uh, that squad was wiped out. But uh, and here's Thimbraeus. This one's yeah, this one's pretty dark. Really hard to capture. If I get closer, that did not help. Yeah, no Martin Scorsese camera work here. Okay, so let's uh, yeah initiative. You can't really see it, but back here there's like um, a trap interface, like door mechanism and traps. You know. Anyway, just fun to do. I don't know. I'm just showing off. It, these were cool to do. I had these were a pain in the butt to make. I mean, for me to design them, they were fine. Do you have them printed, laminated? Oh boy. I hope no one dies because it's going to suck to make redo, uh, redo new ones. But anyway, we're not here for this. We're here for the campaign diary. And this is campaign diary number, I think it's number five uh, out of six sessions. 
So maybe it's either Campaign Diary number five or number six. No, I guess the title will be correct. Um, I don't, I'm losing track. I'm making so many videos, I'm starting to lose track of numbers. But yeah, Campaign Diary number five, and we are still in chapter two. We are. We had two sessions so far in chapter two. We've. I think we've got one more. One more, and we should be done with chapter two. And it was a very challenging game, I think, for everybody at the table, and including myself. It was one of those games, and perhaps you've had games like this, where you walk away from the table and you're not sure what happened. <laughs> you're, uh, it, it's kind of, um, I left the table befuddled, a little befuddled and ambivalent about, you know, how did things go? Did I perform as well as I should have? Did they perform as well as they should have? Did they make the right decisions? Did I make the right decisions? Should I have stamped out some stuff pretty early on? There was a lot of questions I left the table with, and I'm sure many DMs go through this. You know, and oftentimes, what I what I find most often is when I leave the table going, hmm, I'm not sure if that was a good game, my players really enjoy themselves. I don't know what that is. I, I, being behind the screen is just incredibly different. And maybe it's because all the information you have and all the characters you're controlling, you're just trying, you're also trying to entertain as well as play a good game. So maybe there's different expectations there. But um, I was, I really walked away from the table just kind of, wow, that was interesting. That was an interesting session. And matter of fact, I hardly slept that night. I don't know if this affects you as a DM, but I mean, for me, I hardly, I was restless that night. And when I got up in the morning, I, I realized that, you know what, not every game is gonna have the super highs. I think we've had some really good games. Not to be braggadocious, but I think in general we've had some good games. And it's not just because of me, it's because of everybody at the table and what we're doing together. But there's been some pretty good games. But I also, I tend to attribute good games to just how much fun everything was. Like just how many highs you had, you know. And I'm not sure if that's an accurate measurement of what defines a good game, uh, because when I thought about what happened, uh, and we'll get to this, I'm going to get through this. But what I what I thought about when I thought about what happened, you know, there was a lot of tension at the table. I think there was a lot of frustration at the table. I think there was a lot of impatience at the table, and not during the whole game, but at certain moments. There was a lot of indecision at times. There were a lot of crazy decisions that were made. Uh, I think by me and also by many of the players. And all this, I think, it was just a tumultuous gauntlet of all kinds of different emotions that were occurring at the table. Nobody was at each other's throat. I don't want to paint this as some kind of chaotic, chaotic session, but it really shows, it, it emphasizes the, the powder keg chapter two is like, just, I feel like maybe there's a lot of, there was some tension and stress there by all of them, by the situations that they were in. All right. Now let's go into the book. Chapter two in the book. I mean, it really is all kinds of different things. The characters can get into chapter two and they can get out without being spotted. That is definitely part. That is a scenario that can completely play out in your game. Uh, there's also another scenario, which is pretty much characters get captured and they're captured overnight and they're going to be killed the next morning, which is occurring in my campaign as well. Well, what happened with us is I had a little bit of both. Um, the, the characters kind of spread out and did certain things and you know some caused suspicion some did not some just kind of stayed undercover matter of fact our our, our cleric uh, Pax I'll put a picture up here she really was the only one who made it through all these sessions so far in chapter 2 and never was quite never was caught she kept up the ruse of being a cultist and she was put in some pretty awkward situations but she's the only one who kept up the ruse everybody else got caught Everybody else got caught, except for uh, our druid, who we'll get into that. Turned into a horse and ran off. Um, but it was it was crazy. It was it was really really crazy, and it just like the tension kind of cranked up more and more. And like we're going up on the, you're going up on a ramp on a whole uh, roller coaster, and you're just going higher and higher and higher. And things are just getting like, whoa, what are we doing? You know. And um, so in the book, you've got these two things that can happen. And I think as a DM. I was willing to let anything go. Just I'm just going to let these guys make the decisions they're going to make. And if they're rising, they're arousing suspicion. Well, this is going to happen. If they're not arousing suspicion, this is going to happen. Right? They're still going to be fine. So I had quite um, a mixed bag of results because three out of five characters were captured, including Leoslin. They never they never made any headway with Leoslin. He's still tied up, right? Um, so. It was interesting, which is kind of, I would say somebody on the outside might look like it, may, may look at this and go, wow, that was a mess. Maybe, maybe it was, maybe, but um, in hindsight, it was, it was engaging. It was engaging. And um, there were definitely times I was having doubt. 
about what was going on at the table. But I'm going to try to recap this because it's very difficult to recap this. I, I we were doing a podcast as well, so I'm actually recording the podcast, and I started listening to it. I'm like, wow, did we go all over the place? Um, but the first things first, you know, I started the session off with something that I was inspired by from the old adventures book, those choose your own adventure books. And also my recent playthroughs of Banner Saga, which I don't have the second or third one, but I'm playing through the first one. And I like this idea of having choice, you know, just kind of like a scenario that's put up and you have these three choices and three possible outcomes. So that's how I started my session. I'll put some, maybe some images up of what those uh, scenarios look like. And uh, I started the session with that. I put on some music uh, from Tyranny, uh, two tracks in particular, Conquest and The Old Wall, I believe. They are very long tracks. They're very subtle. And I had a TV screen over here, which you can't see, but it's usually sitting over here. And through Google Slides, great place to go to, to do this kind of thing. Uh, through Google Slides, I made two Choose Your Own Adventures. Uh, one encompassed three characters and they each had, I read the question out to them, they could all see it on the TV and then their three choices popped up and you know, whatever they chose, I clicked it and they'd get their results. And what I was trying to do was create some bonuses, but also some negatives, things that could happen in the campaign uh, Friday night, all right? So it could go either way. And there were some choices that really nothing was going to happen. You just, you got no bonuses, no negatives. It just, it just happened. You just chose a different direction. So my characters, uh, players, I should say, my players actually enjoyed that. And I did too, because I was shooting from the hip. I just remember those Choose Your Own Adventures books. And I thought, you know, I want to try this. I want to give this a shot. And it actually only started first. Uh, we haven't done this one. There's a, there's a whole other Choose Your Own Adventure that we just never got to. We just didn't didn't get that far. But there's another one. It started off as just this one thing. And then I thought, hey, let's, well, I've got two characters in prison right now, just chained up. These other three that are walking around the camp, let's just come up with some scenarios that are happening to them. So if you are running this, um, or I guess really running any campaign, hey, throw some of this stuff in. Uh, these kind of these questions it worked out really well and they were kind of excited by that and really enjoyed it and so now I am going to make it more of a staple of my games anyway so we started off with that and uh, people chose I think fairly wisely they all got some uh, significant bonuses uh, and then we kind of just dived right in and we immediately started with the interrogations of our two uh, ranged characters uh, Mortimer and uh, Thembreus who have been captured and also Cricket if there's room, I'll put her here somewhere. Cricket also was hiding in Mortimer's hood, right? And she was kind of in this precarious situation. Uh, well, long story short, uh, the interrogation just kind of get, got worse and worse. Uh, now, Thimbraeus, our thief, actually came up with a pretty good story. He actually spent some time thinking about some things he wanted to say, and I thought that was really clever. Uh, he came up with a pretty plausible story, and for a little bit, he had Frulam's attention, and she was... She wasn't going to let him go, but she understood, okay, maybe this, maybe there's a misunderstanding here somewhat, but they weren't too sure. So she was kind of, she was doubtful, but she was listening to Thimbraeus. But then when she got to um, Mortimer, I think more things started to fall apart, uh, and they began worried. They, 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 they got a little worried about this. Uh, they were, they still felt like they had infiltrators. Uh, Langadrosa walks, walked into the tent and started questioning them. Um, and they did a precursory search. And one thing they found was a red dagger, a ceremonial dagger, which was not designed for killing. This is more of a, uh, aristocracy would give it over to um, different kings, queens. It would be, it, it's kind of symbolizes a message and urgency. And um, they understood it as something to that effect, but they saw it more as a bad omen. They saw this red dagger and they started to put together, falsely in a way, but they started to put together, they thought these guys were infiltrating, their stories were bogus, and they were there to kill them. They were there to take this red dagger and plunge it into the heart of probably one of the commanders. So uh, that kind of escalated the situation the more they actually searched the characters. Eventually, Resimir walks into the tent. Uh, I had her there. She's not necessarily there in the book, but I wanted her there. So she was there, and uh, she walked in, and she is, I feel, more cunning than the other two. At least that's how I'm playing her. More cunning, more patient. And um, she was talking to them, and there was a moment where she stopped, mid-sentence, just stopped. And she pulled out her sword and let it hover over each one of their faces, and they could feel the heat off the blade. And she was hearing a voice, Resimir. She was hearing a voice and suddenly she kind of puts the sword into the dirt and she accuses them of one of them having a talisman. Some, somebody here has a magic item that has not been searched yet and we need to take it off of them. Well, what she was picking up was Cricket. And um, Cricket began to panic. 
And right before this, I, I, should, I guess just to back up, if you want to stop here and go listen to the cutscene, uh, cutscene number five, which actually is the backstory of Cricket, just a small snapshot of Cricket. And that would explain some of her feelings and her emotions and things she was going through because she was almost having a flashback. Uh, Cricket is our fae, but she's also lost her memory. She doesn't know, she doesn't remember her true name. She's just adopted the name of Cricket. But anyway, um, so she is now panicking because the characters are going to be stripped and they're going to find the fairy. And this, and Resimir's already discovered something's not right. Somebody here has a magic item on them. So they begin to strip them and Cricket apologizes as best she can and she pulls out a little emerald sword puts her hand softly on the back of the neck of the ranger and when she sees her opportunity flies out of the hood and it all happened kind of in slow motion and she flew out she had her emerald sword and she cut resimir across the mouth and uh, across the side of the face and she tried to get out and in that split second frulam langdrosa his guard resimir all had their swords out and they see the Fey go right up to the tent, try to bust out of this kind of leather tent. And Resimir immediately captures her in like this crystal sphere. And this is a, a new discovery. In my book, this is, look, if you're running this, don't worry about this. And in my world, which still sets in the Forgotten Realms, the Fey disappeared a long time ago. Uh, so to see a Fey, uh, the, the fairy, is an unusual thing. And so Resimir is shocked by this how the hell do you have a fae? Like, that was the big question. Like, what is this? And so she pressures them. And so she's got Cricket in this uh, glass sphere. And Cricket's just trying to, like, she knows she's in big trouble now. She knows what's going to happen. And um, Resimir uses Cricket against them and tortures her to get more information out of them. And the funny thing is, nobody was willing to give anything. So Cricket was tortured over and over and over again, lightning kind of hitting inside the ball and frying her um, because Resimir wanted to know only one thing, her name. She, well, it is a she. Resimir wanted to know the fairy's name because that is incredibly important when you have a fae. I'm not going to get into here because I don't want to spoil things for future games, but that's incredibly important and she knew that. But again, the enemy is reading things wrong. They saw the red dagger as a vengeful plot and now now Resimir is looking at this fae as a possible bad omen she doesn't like this first of all here's a fae that's returned the fae is attached to this man he shouldn't be and he's denying it he's like i don't know where this came from and she's like that's bs you this fae is connected to you for some reason so now what's happened is the fae has been captured and she went through several rounds of torture and the guys just they were stripped down to their skivvies every you know their thief had <laughs> Plenty of hidden items now that were not hidden anymore. Um, and so uh, they were stripped down and chained up. I think this is where I made one little mistake, and I'll get to this. Hopefully I, I hit on this. So if you're running this, don't make the mistake I did. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're chained up and they're brought back out to where Lang de, um, de Rosa. I'm sorry, Leoslin. Yes. But Resimir has kept Cricket. And she wants Cricket uh, to go to the cavern system where her kind of um, one of her layers is. So right now, Cricket is gone. Now during the torture scene, uh, this is kind of backstory stuff. Uh, our cleric, our druid, sorry, was given a ring by Cler by the Fey, crafted by the Fey, which means in, in my world that they are bonded. Um, they're not necessarily going to feel each other's pain, but that is exactly what's, what is going to happen. When the, the ring was first created, the bond wasn't as tight, right? But as they've adventured together now through six sessions, well, because suddenly uh, Althea, our druid, I'll put a picture up here, uh, was feeling her torture. It was coming through the ring and shooting up her arm. So she's out in the camp amongst all the cultists, all the mercenaries, and screaming out suddenly. And luckily, Storm, our tank, was nearby and kind of went over to her and tried to comfort her and try to figure out what was going on. And of course, Althea knew something's happened to Cricket. She's being tortured. She's being killed. We need to go in there and get there. And I thought first they were going to go running towards that tent, which was the one of their plans. They were, were thinking about doing that very thing. And so I was ready to have the entire host come down on them. And so Althea is screaming out. Uh, because she was feeling the pain and I had her rolling a 1d4 every once in a while. Every time Cricket was tortured, Althea would run uh, roll a 1d4 and that's how many hit points she was losing. It was like this small little leak. Um, uh, not a lot, but enough to be like, okay, something's going on. Uh, Cricket has taken damage before in this adventure, uh, but at the time, Althea and Cricket were not completely connected. Uh, but 
through the, through adventuring and circumstances now they've really become very very close so they're feeling each other's pain and cricket's been cut off inside this crystal ball this crystal prison so uh luckily you know i thought the hammer was going to fall at that moment althea was going to go running back to that tent to rescue her uh, storm managed to calm her down they kind of hid behind some tents like he threw her over his shoulder and tried to you know try to understand what was going on and they storm says somebody to the fact that look we can come back for her but it's not worth dying right now all of us dying to go save her we can come back something to that effect and i thought yes that's that's important i think that's that's a wise decision um so he calmed that situation down so my guards my i'm sorry my guards my prisoners uh mortimer and uh Mortimer and uh, Thimbraeus are now chained up. Langdor, gosh dang, these all these L names in this book are killing me. Leosolen is chained there as well. Now Pax, our cleric, is still continuing the ruse. She has not been discovered whatsoever. And um, so um, after once once they found the Fae, once they found the red dra uh, red dragon, red dagger, once they discovered all these items, that's when Resimir felt like we have been infiltrated there's got to be more here so what they started to do was get all the uh, all the battalions together all the mercenary groups and the kobolds everybody needs to get together into their units so they can discover who is who like who if they know their guard commanders um and who is not really following the system they can start kind of finding out who the infiltrators are so the camp suddenly becomes bustling with activity they could tell they can tell in any moment now, within the next 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes, everything's going to come crashing down because they're not going to know where to go. They're not going to know the guard commanders as the, all their guard commanders are putting battalions together. And Frulam and Lang de Drosa are outside of the tent yelling, getting people into position, yelling out they have infiltrators and they need to find out who it is. So this is when things go crazy. <laughs> this, is when, this is when we have a character death um, and uh, one of our characters is uh, captured and another one fleas this is when things get a little crazy i'm getting fuzzy on these details here because it, so many things happen so many different little things and um so as all as the entire camp now is on alert and moving around getting to position um i believe pax played off being still part of the members uh storm at the time while everybody was running towards the center of the camp to get get into battalions Storm skirted the edge of the cliff. I'll put a map up here. Skirted the edge of the cliff, went over to prisoners, and started the process of trying to pick the locks and try to actually break the chains. And I, the DC was really high on that because I felt like it was important that change should be able to chain a person up. You know, they, they, they should be effective um, to keeping people there and not just easily broken. So he tried, didn't break it. He had thieves tools, tried, didn't get through. And then eventually he tried to pull the stake that they were staked to out to free them and of course the guards at the time were watching the commotion but then they heard that we rolled for it i don't remember what the roll was the dc number so they turn around and there is storm trying to release one actually released one of the prisoners and while that was going on actually i, I missed a step while storm was trying to lick lick pot lick pot wow lock pick uh, Althea came up to the guards and we rolled persuasions and deceptions back and forth and she was just keeping the guards busy by asking questions or whatnot. So we, we did that about three or four times and eventually it failed because they were staying there a really, really long time and um, they looked behind them and that's when some a lot of hell just broke loose. And this is where it became very challenging for me as a DM. And I'm going to tell you what I did and I don't know if it was right. I really don't know if it was the best thing to do. Um, and this is where I started to feel like, uh, I hope this is correct, <laughs> but you, you got to do what you, what you, what you know. And, um, the only thing you can do in the moment, right? The only thing you can do at the moment. So Althea starts to walk away now that storm's been spotted and they go after storm and they yell out, the guards yell out. Someone's been trying to, someone's trying to free the prisoners. We think we found the other inf infiltrator. And so this is when Storm gets surrounded. This is when, on the little corner of the map, I'll put a thing up here, he is surrounded by like a hundred guards, all right? Swords out, spears out. And Frulam and Lang de Drosa come over to see what the commotion is to figure out who this infiltrator is. And in that moment, you know, Storm has got his weapon out. He's ready to pretty much go out, you know, fighting here. He will take on 120 people, right? But they kind of, they, they, they uh, hem him in in that corner. And as a DM, I thought, okay, 
surrender. You, you, there's no option here. There really is no option. Um, but Langadrosa, Frulam came over and Frulam was adamant she'd immediately want to take him prisoner, uh, if not kill him. But Langadrosa had a moment there and he realized, this is the man I fought at the keep. So Langadrosa was more interested in capturing him and maybe having a contest here to fight him again. He wasn't interested in just killing him outright. Right? So this is what's going on through Langa de Rosa's mind. But Fulam is just ready to take prisoners. She's pissed. Her 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 group has been infiltrated. She does, and she feels like this uh, a symphony of mistakes have happened. We're getting him. Well, Sturm, Storm does not. He doesn't surrender. He pulls out his sword, challenges a lot of people, and they're like, "Hey, you are outnumbered. You ain't going anywhere." Well. Storm, after a series of rolls, and we try to figure this out, we looked at the player's handbook, did all the math and whatnot. <laughs> he, instead of surrendering or maybe giving into this or whatnot, he is right next to the cliff, right? So he jumps. He does a running jump up the cliff. I think he, because of his strength scores and the math and whatnot, he, leap, he leaps up about 16 feet on the cliff. Now, remind, let me remind you, the cliff is 150 feet high, right? And this, I kind of felt like as a DM, I was like, just personally, like just to be kind of transparent, I thought at first that he was being a little reckless here. I, I, I began to wonder, does he want to kill his character? I, I don't know. I just that, that was just something that was going through my mind at that moment. But it was really complex at the table what was happening. So he jumps up on the cliff and then he still got movement. So I, I let him climb. And then I felt like, all right, we're in initiative. And this is where, as a DDM, I was kind of like, what do I do here? I am not rolling initiative for a hundred people, right? That's impossible. So, or, um, so I, uh, I think it was more like uh, he was around about thirty or something. The battalions were still forming. I can't remember now. It, it was a crazy night. So, he got up. He eventually climbed up about thirty-three feet. At that point, I was like, "All right, roll initiative." And what I had to do back here behind the screen was like, "Okay, I just broke up the the. I think it was like thirty people. The thirty people into groups of ten. And I just rolled one initiative for the entire group, all right? And, and you know, they all took out bow and arrows, right? Because Storm had made his move. He was sitting there up on the cliff trying to get away. Well, it was their turn. And so I had all the little things here set up and I had to make quick initiative cards for an entire group, laid it all out. And the first group fired their bows and arrows hit and miss a bunch of stuff. They did not enough to kill them or knock them down. But there was one group that I rolled and it was just like a bullseye um, and pretty much Storm was hit by a lot of arrows, a lot of arrows and uh, he took like 50 points of damage. He's only level three. He took 50 points of damage and on top of that fell from the cliff because once you're hit like that, you're out, you're done. You're not holding on to the cliff anymore. And so he plummets down the side of the cliff. And it definitely is about two death saves. Like he's he's the, the he took a tremendous amount of hit, uh, damage, but also falling as well. So in, in my book, we didn't roll this, but he was already at two death saves. It was done. And I don't know if that was the right call. I, really don't, I don't know if I did that correctly. I don't know if that was the best way to handle it because it was very very large groups. There may have been even more than that. And you know, you also have the Langdrosa on the field and Fulam on the field. And Pax was actually our cleric was in the middle of that group that was firing on Storm, and she was just kind of pretending. She had her her mace out, you know, but she just had to go along with this. She had to go along with this ruse. And um, so Storm is down. He's laying on the floor, and they immediately Langdrosa is pissed. Langdrosa is pissed. He wanted combat. He wanted honorable sword to sword combat and he's pissed at uh, Frulam for making the decision the call shoot him down with a bunch of arrows so Langdorosa immediately gets the body and he's at two death saves and they start picking him up and Langdorosa has every intention of bringing him back to life like healing him because he is he just feels like he's, he, it's his enemy but he has honor and he wanted to go blade to blade with this guy at some point again uh, and he, he found it to be kind of brave and almost audacious uh, to actually come back to the camp, you know. In his mind, he, he infiltrated the camp to probably kill him, right? So um, what happened at that point, the, the units start to break up. Storm is at two death saves, has one more to go, and Pax works her way through the crowd, 
gets close to the guys who are carrying Storm and puts her hand on him. Like she's kind of bumping, moving her way through, and she just, as she passes by, she uses a cantrip of Spare the Dying, touches Storm, and goes on her way. Right? Just, just goes on her way. And so that prevented him from dying, right? Obviously, Spare the Dying, right? So it got him to zero hit points. And so to wrap that up really quick, you know, now, now we've got, now we got Storm, Prisoner, uh, Leoslin, Prisoner, Mortimer, Prisoner, and uh, Thimbraeus, Prisoner. Pax, still undercover, and Althea. Now, I'm a little fuzzy on this, exactly what happened. I think um, Althea was also cornered at the moment when Storm was being attacked. And the prisoners, uh, the guards became suspicious of her and how she was out down there talking with the pr uh, prisoners. And so one of the questions that none of these characters can answer was, who's your guard commander? What unit are you with? They did, she didn't have anything either. Just like last session, these guys didn't have anything, right? And that was like the, and everybody was such on high alert that that was a dead giveaway. So they took her, they put her under arrest uh, and put some uh, chains on her because they felt like they found maybe possibly another infiltrator. So over here, uh, maybe I'll put a map out, that'd be a little bit easier. But over in the left corner, you got Storm and all this stuff and packs going through. And then over the other corner where the prisoners are, you've got Althea being escorted up to the tent. Well, she's about halfway to the tent. Halfway to the tent. And she transforms into a war horse. So the handcuffs, uh, yeah, the bracers, I don't know, uh, this is another better term here. I'm, it's, it's escaping me. Bust apart. The guards are caught off guard, right? Because suddenly they were escorting a person and now they have a war horse next to them. And she, I thought, gosh, what happened there? She, she escaped that group and ran back towards the prisoners. And I, and if I remember right, I think she was trying to save them. I think she was trying to, um, I think she was trying to either get to Pax, who was kind of down in that area, um, or she was trying to get to Leos Leosalind to get him out of there at least. Um, but she started fighting as a horse, those people down there. And at one point, Thimbraeus managed to get the stake that he was tied to up and out, and but he was still chained up, and he was hopping along, and he tried to hop onto the war horse to at least maybe to escape. It failed miserably. He did not get anywhere, and he was kind of tackled by a couple of cultists who saw him trying to escape. And uh, Althea put up a fight down there as a horse, kicking, trampling, doing as much as she could. Storm, at this same time, Storm's over there getting attacked, right? So everything just went to hell. And it was really bizarre for me to DM to try to control all this that was going over here, but also this stuff that was going over here. And then Pax also being undercover. I mean, it it was challenging. It really kept me on my toes, to, to be completely honest. But what eventually happened was Althea saw it was a lost cause. She could not get through. And the only thing that was going to happen was that she was going to be caught next. And so Cricket has been taken away. Now four, three people have been taken into custody. So she eventually turned heels and ran out of the camp, used her double movements, double actions, and just got the hell out of there as, as a horse. And so many people were up front trying to get in the battalions and she kind of ran through. It was just a horse, right? They just saw a horse running through. The horse running through, and by the time she got to the entrance of the camp, many of the kobolds were still, were still on guard, but they weren't, they weren't looking for horses running around. They were looking for people. So she kind of barreled through them and went into the grasslands. Um, and at that point, too, Pax, I think, kind of packed it in. She realized, too, that there's nothing I can do here. So she, as people were still now worked up from the battle with Storm, worked up over the battle that was happening to the prisoners, she worked her way out. She kind of skirted the cliff as well, and through a couple stealth checks, left the campsite. So I've got, currently, let me just recap where we're at now. Four people imprisoned, two people outside of the camp, way outside of the camp, and then Cricket, who is somewhere in the, ca in the caves, it was, it was a challenged run. I, I, I think I, it was a good game, but I, I, that was one of the few moments where I felt a little inept. I really did. I felt like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. And there were questions I was having of myself afterwards, like, man, should I rein that in a little bit more? Should I just put the hammer down and let things just like quell what was going on? But I felt, and please, I may have been wrong, right? Put it in the comments, I may have been wrong. But I, I felt like at the moment, I need to let go of these reins and let 
things fall where they may. All right. If two or three people captured and two get away, that's just the way it's going to be. Right. And uh, that's how I let it go. And this is kind of what happened. So if you are running Horde of the Dragon Queen and you're in chapter two, be prepared for anything. Really be prepared for anything. I, I'm going to do a chapter tip chapter tips on chapter two. Uh, that video is going to be coming up soon because we're about to wrap up chapter two. And um, man, it was challenging. It was challenging. Um, in, a, in, a, in a rural way and managing people because everybody was so all over the place. Um, everybody had ideas. Everybody had things they wanted to do, risky things, you know, balancing suspicion levels and would they have seen this? Would they have been suspicious of that? It was a mess, you know. And so I'm not trying to be hard on myself. Um, I think I did okay, but there may have been better ways. And so that's what this process is, right? The next time this happens, I'll have a better way of dealing with it. But at the time, it made sense. And a lot more a lot more shenanigans happened too during this process. And I'll probably have to go back and listen to that podcast to really understand everything that happened. But, uh, you know, sometimes as a DM, you're sitting behind the screen and it, and, you, and you're, shaking, you're shaking your head. Not because you're disappointed by anything, but it's just like you... you you feel like you can't manage it all. You know, it, it becomes a little overwhelming at times. And I was, I think I was feeling that um, a little bit Friday night. So it was, it was good. It was interesting. It was tough. It was challenging. Um, like I said, I feel like there was, between players, I feel like maybe there was some frustration with how things were done or answered or risky things that people did. But I think that makes a good game. I think that really does make a good game. Uh, when there's this huge amount of emotions and decisions and all this stuff that's happening in a single session. So we'll be wrapping up chapter two, I think, by Friday, if by the gods nothing else has happened. Um, some mistakes I made, uh, I, I think I should have tied the prisoners up instead of giving metal chains. And maybe this is something I'll put in the chapter tips. I don't want to go too far into this, but um, that became an issue. And I think I'll cover that in my tips. But just, I guess what I can say is don't put them in chains, put them in ropes time up and, there, and there, there's a reason for that so um anyway the night was fun don't get me wrong the night was fun the choose your own adventure stuff really really worked people were excited about that we went into one of my longest cutscenes ever five and a half minutes and that ramped up the drama and the tension really really well just go back and you know watch that video and it explains that and so that fed in it fed into everything that happened that night so yeah there's probably more, but I can't remember it now because it was just so crazy. But anyway, guys, I think that's I think that's all I have. If I have anything, I'll maybe plop it in here, edit it, um, and put it in. I'll try to put as many images as I can. There was not a lot of time to like screen capture or anything because it was just it was just chaos. Just responding to all the different things that were happening on different areas of the map. But I'm glad we went through it. I'm kind of I'm I'm glad. To, it was encouraging to see what was happening. People were playing their characters. I mean, not that everybody was reckless or anything, but people were doing, I think, what their characters would have done. And that's good, right? I think that that's, that's good. It makes for a good game. So, all right, guys, I'm not going to bore you to death anymore with this campaign diary. I'm not sure how this sounds. I'm kind of, <laughs> I haven't slept well in the past couple of days. I mean, I, so many thoughts, really, so many thoughts going through my head of how I could have done this better or should have done this or what I want to do next. So I'm um, a little fatigued. But um Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for watching the Campaign Diaries. If you've been keeping up, I appreciate it. Um, the saga continues. Eventually, a podcast will be up and, and, and probably on SoundCloud and maybe even iTunes. We'll see how that goes. And you can listen to it and kind of hear all the things that happened that night. You might even hear the fear in my voice <laughs> or the hesitations. All right. But anyway, guys, I'll let you go. Um, the next thing should be... I did the cutscene first, actually this time, the campaign diary. There are a couple more things in the pipeline that are on their way out. And soon the uh, chapter two tips will be uh, recorded and posted. All right. All right, guys, that's it. I will see you in the next video.